Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. So I'm going to see the backs of your heads and now the fronts of your faces. Well, sort of. <laughs> we're, we're happy that you're here. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of announcements. Uh, the bulletin um, calendar this week. Uh, we will continue to Zoom um, book study. And there's still some copies out here. You're welcome to join us. You don't have to have had attend to the others, and we'll send you a link if you'd like. Um, and next Sunday, we have a surprise, a couple of surprises. Um, do you want to give them a little preview? Sure. You want me to talk? Yeah. Uh, so, a friend of mine, uh, Jack Fox, who is... Well, let me set it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> let me set it up. Um, some people don't realize that Rob is not our permanent choir director, music director. Rob has a full-time job, and he loves his avocation, probably his music, and uh, we're so delighted that he's here, and Rob informed me that next weekend, Jack, who is, is thinking about being here full-time, he just going to be in track, and he's a friend of mine, so we're going to play some uh, Candy Wax uh, for the preacher again next week. And so. Yeah, so Jack Fox will be here. Um, I've known Jack for 30 years, so happy that he's even willing to think about doing this, and uh, they're going to move back here maybe by the end of the year, and um, just we're just so fortunate that, Rob, you're here, and I'm looking forward to next weekend, so thank you. Um, next Sunday is also our food collection days for the 
food damages, so bring any items you can think of. They do need cereals and condiments and anything else you might want to share. And then um, the Habitat Project. Um, Betty, do you want to uh, say anything about that?
keep them in prayer and those who are working on the project and those who are, have given. Uh, this week, I received a mail a check, a donation. I uh, didn't know that it was going to happen. We actually had an article that was published in the India Hoosier, which is the statewide disciples newspaper. And from that, one of the members of the church I was ordained in read it and sent us $500. And she didn't send it to me, she sent it to the church. And I, I made sure that they knew we received it and how much we appreciated it. It was it's just a, another moment where people want to be involved in something and want to encourage. And that's what we want to do. We want to encourage others. So um, with that, let's take a moment for prayer and we'll begin our worship service. <laughs> Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for today. We thank you for our church. We thank you for the many ministries that we involve ourselves in. We particularly lift up those who are working on the Habitat Project and the family who will receive the house. We ask now, God, that you turn our hearts toward you this hour. May we give to you our concerns. May we worship you in the midst of our concerns. That when we leave this place, we will be refreshed. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Would you stand as you're able for 261?
So Donna's brother passed away yesterday, and um, I knew he was sick, but I didn't realize how serious, so we will keep Donna and the family in prayer. I believe it's in Tennessee somewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> Any other? I've uh, already, um, Dean, Bill, and Rosemary started the chemotherapy process here. joys or concerns. Let's take a moment for some silent prayer and we'll have another prayer. Let us Most loving and gracious God, we this morning as a community of faith, bring before you our concerns and our cares, our joys, our sorrows. We are grateful that Connie's mother has returned to her home and pray that her future health would be one of many good years of good health. We're grateful that Valerie Dean was able to have a kind of uh, medical care that is thorough and will help her live a long life. We pray that this chemotherapy session uh, series will be very successful. We're also reminded that we live in a very difficult time because of the COVID-19 virus. We pray for Donna and her family, her brother who passed away, and all those who are suffering from this pandemic. For there are many. We pray for our country and our world. We pray for those that are trying to leave Afghanistan safely. We pray for the leaders, that they would have wise decisions and execute them well. We do not understand, Lord God, why people want to hurt each other, but we continually do so. It is a difficult thing to witness. We pray that the days ahead would be filled with safety and peace. In the midst of such trying times, we ask, O oh God, that you would awaken us in our hearts to the many ways that you have blessed us, and the many ways that you have given us your love and support through the years. 
that in doing so, we'll remember that you are with us now and will be in the future. For it's in looking back that sometimes we're reminded of God that you really are here, even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of war, even in the midst of Give us the energy we need, O oh God, to be your people. To see through the Habitat Project. That this new family that will have a safe home will be blessed by it. That joy would permeate that place and that family would thrive. We are grateful for the many people who donated to this project, their time, their prayers, and in their way. We're so fortunate to have a Habitat affiliate here in our town. We ask that you bless them, oh God. Help us not to live out the prayer that Jesus taught by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we from the book of Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, 14 through 15, and 21 through 23. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews 
do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders, and they do not eat anything from the market unless it has been washed. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do you, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesies rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, price, wickedness, deceit, lustitiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Let us be blessed by the reading. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you that you have brought us here. Now take our minds and think through them. Take our hands and put them to your use. Take my lips and speak through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Sometimes you miss certain people, don't you? Over time, you go, I really don't know where that person, how I could have gotten along without that person now they're not here. I <clears throat> reminded that again week after week when Sharon Gordon no longer proves my bulletin. She was a stickler. <clears throat> and it was a blessing for me because she would, uh, after a couple of weeks of correcting me from the pulpit, uh, sitting in the pew, I thought, well, Sharon, why don't you come and help me prove this before we printed it? And she did. So she would have probably realized that I put Betty on one thing and Ruby on another. She probably would have picked up that I left off the one on the phrase hand, first verse. But you know, sometimes it just happens that way. There are imperfections. Those who seek <clears throat> perfection seem to be constantly disappointed. Those that want to do everything the right way, the way that it's supposed to be, are often the ones that are the most miserable. Because how often does that really happen? That things work out the way they're supposed to. Supposed to. Well, we should just get that word out of our vocabulary, right? Supposed to. It reminded me of a, young, a story of a young minister right out of seminary, freshly ordained, in his first congregation. And you may have heard a story about this guy, or a story like this, where he thought it was a bit odd. Remain seated. And then halfway through the prayer, he could hear people talking to each other. And then it got louder and louder until they got in a fight of words. And the preacher just kept praying and said, Amen. And everybody sat down. But well, he was really thrown by this, as you can imagine. He, he actually in the community had a retired minister from that congregation, so he sought that guy out. This retired minister said, What's the tradition? Why do people do 
came in half standing, half seated, and, and then they were complaining about the other person's reaction. And the older minister said, well, I don't quite remember it as a tradition as I've been taught. And he said, well, they remain seated during the prayers. Is that right? He said, oh, no, that wasn't the tradition. So they stood up. Was that the No, that wasn't it either. And the young minister was just frustrated. He threw his hands up in the air and he said, there's got to be a solution and a reason for this, and I've got to figure this out. And the old pastor's face split up and smiled. And he lifted a finger in the air and he said, oh, now I remember. Yes, that was the tradition. They liked to fight. It reminded me when I was serving a, uh, for the summer a church who was between ministers. And it was a neighboring church in the community that I was a member of. And it was a Presbyterian church down the street. They just need somebody to fill in until their new minister showed up. And as somebody who's only there a short time, knowing that one's there a short time, these can be a little honoring. I could be, at least. So I was, <laughs> I was doing a sermon on trying to do things differently, being aware of strangers, being aware of greeting people, how being a mindful of our surroundings, and we get such a hat, seating in the same place, doing, uh, talking to the same people. So this is my third or fourth Sundays, right? And I, I said, okay, I'd like you all to stand before the service starts, and I'd like you to switch places across the aisle. And people, you would have thought <laughs> that I said, take your clothes off. We're going to have a naked service. One, one old guy in the front said, I'm not moving. I said, then you're the object of the sermon. Pay attention. You can say that when you're not going to be there very long, right? So maybe you had better memories than me. <laughs> I have a feeling they remember that morning because I try to say, look around and see what you see. Do you see anything different? Anything that you notice that you maybe didn't before because you're always seated in the same place. They didn't really talk much after the service because they're polite, they're Presbyterian, except for one old guy. <laughs> he didn't say where do you to go. He just kind of snarled at me and went to the There was a story of uh, Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria was uh, a notorious monarch of uh, many ways. One was the way she conducted herself during a state dinner. Um, and I think it may be an exaggeration that some historians portray her as being very unkept and eating as much as she possibly could, and then she's done. She loved to eat dessert, so she quickly got through the first course, the second course, the third course, the fourth course, and finally she get to the dessert. But the thing was, if she finished a course, everybody at the table had to finish that course. So people in her court realized that if they wanted to eat anything, they had to eat in a hurry, because she was going to be done very quickly. The staff quickly moved the plates around and put the next thing in the place of her, in front of her, to get to that dessert. Well, the story that I found about her was a reception, a diplomatic reception, dinner, state dinner. It was, uh, to the guest of honor, was an African chieftain who was not schooled in the English way of behavior. You see, um, partway through the meal, the type of food that they were eating with their hands, they needed to cleanse their fingers. And so they had on the table uh, presented after that course, between courses, a bowl, a finger bowl. You remember being at your grandparents' house or something where you had to use a finger bowl and you dip your little fingers in the bowl and then you wipe them on your napkin? Well, this African chieftain did not understand this custom. 
He looked at the bowl that was being served between the courses. He took it with both hands, and he drank it all in one sip. To the horror of everyone there, except the queen, she cleared her throat, picked up the finger bowl, and she drank it too. And all of the guests did likewise, because the queen had done that. Every last crop. Well, the British pepper press, they probably had a lot to say about that dinner, for sure. It was against the rules to drink out of a finger bowl. But that particular evening, the queen changed the rules. Have hospitality. I think it relates to this story that we have before us in the scripture today. You see, the Pharisees had made a tradition out of a household law that was created. And it was created for cleanliness. They had a whole list of household laws to take care of food, how to cook, how to clean, how to behave. And this was with the hope that people would not get sick. And over time, these traditions are even handed down today in Jewish families. The most of who are the most Orthodox still follow some of those very strict rules of cleanliness. Put the dinner uh, for a um, group that at least it was, in, it was being hosted by the local synagogue in Indianapolis. And it was a Ramadan dinner for them. The end of the uh, fasting for the month of Ramadan for the Muslim community. They were invited, the Christian community was invited in, and women from all three traditions gathered in the kitchen to prepare the meal in the Jewish congregation. And they had to wait to be told don't do that, do this, don't touch that pot with that food, do this, do that. I had a rabbi who was, I call her my rabbi. Um, because she taught me so much. Uh, she and I were both chaplains at the same time in the same hospital. And Rabbi Heidi, and if you're going to have a rabbi, isn't that a great name, Rabbi Heidi? She was somewhat stereotypical of any Jewish rabbi. And so she said that this is really done though, because you don't want to mix things that shouldn't be together. For example, an Orthodox Jew would never have a cheeseburger. All Jewish friends I grew up with had cheeseburgers. They said, well, they shouldn't have. Because cheese comes from a cow. The meat comes from a cow. And you, it could be that the cheese was being made and that it put on the meat from the mother of the cow who helped produce the cheese. Okay. But I still like my cheeseburger. And all my Jewish friends growing up, they somehow made it to our house when there was uh, food they shouldn't eat and decided they would have food with us, dinner with us. And I think their mothers all knew what was going on. But people don't get it even today. One of my Jewish friends still lives in Evansville, was the president of the synagogue. He married another friend who grew up United Church of Christ. And she was a blonde. And every blonde joke would fit her. I mean, that's how the stereotypes happened. Some of them just really fit. And she decided they had, they had a potluck, and she brought green beans. And she said the only way to really make good green beans is to put egg in them for flavor. And the rabbi was inspecting the dishes, and apparently she was out. And she said, well, I didn't know. It's better this way. You know, just innocent as can be. And I have a feeling that um, some people still snub a, a, a spoonful of that. Breaking the rules, being against the rules sometimes is not easy. And it isn't easy even today. The scripture that was paired with this the, from the epistles was James, the beginning of the book of James. And James. It, it, it's interesting in James because 
He's trying to work out his own theology in the midst of a Greek culture from a Jewish background. And he mixes up some Greek philosophy with Jewish customs, and it's a little confusing for us to read. But the bottom line for James is to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Not just to listen to the word, but to be a doer of the word. I suspect many of us could be uh, chastised for not listening to the word, not speaking the word, not reading the Bible like we once did, perhaps. Do we read the scriptures to our grandchildren and great grandchildren? Do we read the scriptures for each other, for edification? I had a professor in seminary who grew up in the Ozarks, and he said that every kid in his church was a Bible kid because they had contests where they put their Bible on the floor in front of them, and somebody, uh, the teacher, would yell out a scripture, and whoever got to it first would win a prize. I knew that that would never happen in my church growing up. It would take a long time to find a Bible like that. What? We don't spend enough time, do we, on Bible study. I think we do really good at being caring, being mindful, and really fulfilling the scriptures, but are we good enough at listening to the scriptures? Maybe that's a word for another time, but it does kind of concern me. I think we are doers of the word, however. And I believe that's what Jesus would prefer. Rather than to just know the Word of God, to live the Word of God out. Anytime that you speak to somebody that you don't know is a doer of the Word, or give food to a shelter, or to a pantry, or to a homeless person is a doer of the Word. Anytime you were to visit somebody in prison or the hospital, or do something kind to a stranger, that's a doer of the Word. Building a house for people we don't even know certainly is a doer of the word. Basic housing is the basic stuff of Maslow's um, pyramid of hierarchy. And you have to have the basic stuff. You have to have safety, shelter, water, food. It's just the basics. Now, Betty says it ought to have internet on the bottom of that pyramid. She got the deeper issues. What comes out of our mouths can defile us. And Jesus goes through the list 
that we see in so many places in the Scripture in the New Testament. It's not living the right way. It's being greedy. It's maybe giving in to our addictions. Maybe it's, um, in our culture, walling ourselves off in our own silos, only talking to people who think like us politically or religiously. It's not easy to be a disciple in our day and age. I'm not sure it's easy to be anything in our day and age. But you know what? The harder way to go is to push through our fears and to reach out to people we don't know or don't agree with or don't understand and try to build a relationship. That's the harder way. And when we do that, when we open ourselves up to doing something that is against our typical nature, and it's in a given area of life, blessings follow. It's not typical that a congregation like such as ours, a small congregation, would, would build a house, would habitat. It's not typical that it's possible. And if it's possible, why not try it? And you all are doing that. And we're blessing a family that we don't even know. Perhaps changing that family's life for several generations to come. What comes out of us? Sometimes it's fear. But there are other times when it's faith. When it's statements of challenge that, okay, let's try this. You all get it. You do it. Maybe I'm saying we just don't do it enough. We don't challenge ourselves enough to be walking the harder path. So why do we follow usual rituals without thinking? Think about that for a moment. What do you do that you always do and you've never given it a thought to? We need to change that. We need to think what practices Just do them for fun. I dare say there are many challenges before us in our culture, in our town, and even in our church. But those challenges can be met if we begin to look inward and listen. Will you join me around the table where Jesus reminds us again and again to remember his life, his death, and his life to come. We are going to sing our communion hymn number 393. Will you join me?
At that supper, Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to all present, all who were present. This becomes for us our bread of life. And then he took the cup and blessed it, saying, This now becomes for us Jesus' blood, a sacrifice for which we do not deserve. He said, Drink of this cup, eat of this bread, as often as you eat in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful for this communion hour. We ask that you bless this bread that we break together and we partake in another cup as we need your continuing presence and guidance in our daily living. Amen. Let us now share.